Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Major Max Nada, who is a U.S. Marine Corps officer who recently completed the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. Max Nada, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you, John. Great to be part of the program. And I'd just like to say up front to our audience that uh, Major Nada's opinions are his own and do not reflect the opinions of uh, any U.S. military branch or the Department of Defense. So the conversation I'd like to have with you today, Max, will cover your recent master's thesis from the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College entitled Multinational Operations in Strategic Competition, Leveraging the Inherent Informational Aspects Through Culture and Narrative. But before we get into your thesis, uh, I'd like to dig a little deeper into your bio. So you've got a uh, non-traditional background within the Marine Corps. Uh, could you give us just a real quick uh, review of the kinds of things that you've been doing, and then also maybe uh, use that to uh, help uh, to let us know how this shaped your understanding of our strategic landscape. Yes, of course, John. Uh, so two things I, I think of that I would like to highlight with my background is one, I think it gives me a little bit of a different perspective on things uh, than the traditional route. And then also, I I also noticed that I, I have a different focus and in, in specifically in South Com security cooperation uh, that helped uh, drive my interest in the thesis, but um, originally active duty. Uh, after my first tour, I joined the reserves, and in the reserves, I uh, did a couple of deployments to Southcom with uh, special purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force Southcom. Uh, from there, I went to Mar 4 URAF um, as a supply officer, uh, working the G4, and then I switched over, did some stuff in Africa FOPS, uh, but I think, I think basically the thing I would like to get at with that is that I just hit active duty, I hit contractor, I hit reserves, I hit into a PACOM AOR, uh, Southcom, UCOM. And I, that's, I think that's relevant because one of the questions we've been wrestling a lot uh, here at school, at CGSC Army School, is um, information as a war funding function. And mm -hmm. I think the Marine Corps hits it in the sense of more of a generalist which resonates with me versus the army. On the other hand, they don't have it as a war fighting function. So one thing we've been wrestling a lot with our classes uh, is the Marine Corps right with making a war fighting function is the army uh, right and not making a war fighting function. But the more I looked at it, uh, it's, it is definitely not as cut and dry as that, um, particularly because information is so big. And now that we're finally starting to get our hands wrapped around it, uh, I think we're starting to be able to classify a little better from tactical to strategic or short term to uh, long term effects or more technical stuff to more cognitive stuff in a sense. I see. And you just recently completed the Army Command and General Staff College, but you uh, were also part of a cohort of students that were in the uh, information advantage, like sub curriculum or something. How, how would you describe the that that track that that you were in? So CGSC um, does have a lot of great opportunities here. Uh, one, because you can do a, a different type of master's called a master of military art and science, where you could uh, write a thesis like I did. And if you're doing that, they have two programs, the Art of War program uh, or scholars program and the Information Advantage Scholars program. So great opportunity. Very, very thankful that uh, I got to do it. But basically, there's we got pulled into our own specific uh, staff group in a sense, 12 of us, all focusing on information in some sense. We had myself and a couple others, actually, the majority of others that are going to be on your, your uh, uh, Cognitive Crucible podcast are from more of the, the cognitive side of stuff. 
but then we also have more of the technical side with cyber um, and, and EW and a couple other pieces. So we, we get the full spectrum. And what we did is basically wrestle with the questions throughout the entire uh, semester of what is information? How do you achieve information advantage? And uh, we saw a lot of army organizations. We uh, saw some joint organizations, went to the Pentagon. We got to go to Quantico and talk to Nikayak. Uh, we got to talk to Nick Will. Uh, we got to go to Cybercom. Uh, we had a lot of um, uh, civilian industry that we work with too. And, and even on top of that, like one thing that I think is just awesome little note to throw out there or maybe bragging right is uh, we got to talk to the previous uh, uh, press secretary of uh, Ukraine uh, at one oh, point. Wow. So yeah. it's just full spectrum of anything that could be relevant to um, information. We, we uh, kind of dug into it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It sounds like a really uh, valuable um, uh, immersive uh, experience and uh, getting a whole bunch of perspectives on the problem, uh, which also, I mean, give your, with your background, you know, you, you too bring a lot of different experiences to the problem set, which is relevant. I, I guess something that I've discovered through, you know, a whole bunch of these uh, uh, cognitive crucible episodes is that um, uh, interdisciplinary Ness, <laughs> uh, you know, having a bunch of uh, uh, perspectives uh, is uh, a useful to bring to the table in um, uh, addressing these challenges. Um, and I think that kind of leads us into your thesis. And again, it's uh, multinational operations in strategic competition. Uh, could you talk about you know what interested you or inspired you to do this research? Uh, yeah, of course. But if you don't mind, you mind if I talk one second back to that that interdisciplinary sure. piece? Yeah, sure. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Yeah. So the one the one thing when I found it very interesting when we talked about the the war fighting function between the Marine Corps and the the Army and Joint, of course, too, um, is that kind of interdisciplinary in a sense. Uh, so the Marine Corps having it as a war fighting function uh, makes it applicable to everyone, and, and that that is also just innate. Uh, to the Marine Corps culture in a sense, that expeditionary mindset. Um, and so that's where you see um, General Glavy, uh, DCI, he was originally a pilot. Um, I don't know if the current uh, Commander McKayak was an RD officer, but a, you regularly see RD officers in charge of McKayak or Anglico or uh, different organizations like that. So you find people that aren't information specific in charge of information organizations. And I think that has a lot to do with the the kind of generalist aspect to it. Um, and, and that's where a little different from the army, but that's also where it's different because I think the Marine Corps treats information more on the um, cognitive side. So it, it is more generally applicable to everyone on the cognitive side versus the army. I saw a little more of a steer towards more of the technical side where that makes sense that it's more difficult for them to make it a warfighting function because if they're focused on a technical side, you can't make that so much applicable to everyone. Mm. But what I saw, though, uh, where we as a whole, Army, Marine Corps, everyone is doing the best at information is when you do approach it from a generalist or interdisciplinary approach. So two of the great examples I saw during our semester is we talked to um, – the CG of Army's uh, Cyber Center of Excellence. And the thing that was awesome is, I mean, well, we got hammered with a lot of cyber stuff, which is great because I don't know anything about cyber. Now I can know a little bit of cyber. Uh, uh, but we went to the Army Cyber uh, Excellence. Their CG didn't talk about cyber. He talked about influence. Mm -hmm. And we went there like right after the, the Chinese weather air balloon, uh, yeah. uh, air quotes right there, the weather balloon went over the U.S., and he was talking about the, the influence of that and also the first time really that a lot of U.S. people are opening their eyes to seeing China in a different perspective. Uh, uh, so looking at it from a, an influence side on competition a little bit. And then another piece, too, is we talked about a, a uh, 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 one of the multi-domain task forces that the Army has, and mm -hmm. it was an Army officer filling the uh, COPSO billet for that. 
And it was an RD officer filling a COPSO billet that was learning all the strengths of leveraging cyber, leveraging authorities, uh, and leveraging influence things. So the examples I've seen, whether it's a technical person using general stuff or a general person using technical stuff, is it's really successful when you get that interdisciplinary piece to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great perspective. Um, yeah, so could we uh, uh, talk a little bit more about your study and you know what interested you or inspired you to uh, pursue this research? Uh, yes, of course. So a um, little bit about the background is 2016, uh, I deployed to Central America with Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force Southcom 16, so 2016. Um, I did that as a supply officer. And then I deployed with them again in 2018 as uh, the liaison officer to the U.S. Embassy in Honduras. And then I, was, I, I stayed on again to do it in 2019 as the key leadership coordinator for the, the commanding officer. And so what I saw was... Um, so, so, so if I could ask, so mm -hmm. that's three separate deployments to the same area of operations um, in three different roles. Yes. Okay. All right. Excellent. Proceed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that's where as a, as a reservist, uh, you get a lot more flexibility. So, sometimes a little more added headaches, but definitely a lot more freedom and deployment mm -hmm. opportunities if you want them. Yeah. Uh, so in 16, though, I was a supply officer and I, I 16 was the first um, SB MAGTAS Southcom uh, being sourced from the reserve side. Um, so 15 was the first one, 16 was the first fully one that had its modern construct. Uh, so I saw the understanding. I saw Honduras, which is where we are based out of. And I saw its mission a little bit, security cooperation. We had uh, ground combat element where we had uh, security cooperation training teams in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize. Uh, we had an engineering team um, or engineering teams that did uh, humanitarian assistance projects. Um, uh, foreign, foreign humanitarian assistance. And then we had uh, four 53s, CH 53s that were our ace to hmm. uh, for logistics mobility. And then really, we were doing a lot of steady state security cooperation, FHA, uh, foreign humanitarian assistance. But the real mission was to be prepared to support a hurricane response. So we deployed down there and during hurricane season. So 16, I saw the general construct. Um, in 18, when I went down, I worked at the embassy. I saw the embassy environment, and I really started to see a lot more of the um, benefits we were having on the competition side and more of the, the, the less strictly military things that I would normally see, working with the, uh, the SDO DAT and Naval Attaché and just building relationships between, say, the Coast Guard and Honduras and basing and accessing uh, and, and so forth. And then in, in 19, where it really opened my eyes is that what we did in 16, we had four countries. It was a U.S. only task force then too. What we did in 18, uh, we had the first uh, Colombian that joined our task force. So in 18, it became uh, a multinational task force. We had a Lieutenant Colonel Colombian that was the deputy commander of the task force. So this was an 06 led task force and it was just shy of 300 personnel. Um, and so I started to see some of the benefits that we had when it switched from U.S. to multinational. Mm -hmm. But then in 19, so four countries about in 16, uh, about five countries in 18, we, we added one international partner. And then in 19, uh, I was a key leadership coordinator for the, the commanding officer. So I traveled with him, the CEO, and again, Lieutenant Colonel Deputy Commander from Columbia to all the countries for all the key leadership engagements. But that four to five countries, the 19 turned into about uh, 12 or 13 countries. And then we also had 10 um, international, uh, multinational partners added to the task force too. So we added one and all of a sudden the um, input and interest uh, and willing to work with us from the entire region just exploded at really negligent cost. The, the mm. cost was the, the daily per diem of 
like twelve dollars a day basically of uh, chow for the international personnel to join the task force. But basically, their their countries funded uh, their regular pay and other stuff too. So it was uh, what I really look at the paper is um, I want to try and capture because I I don't think it was fully captured given um, Southcom Mar for South being resource constrained always really trying to just survive in some senses that by just adding international personnel onto our task force, making it a multinational task force instead of U.S. was very, very little cost. But all the strategic competition, all the information effects that we tried to have with it were in some senses three to five times as strong in terms of uh, activities we're doing and countries we're working with. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, um, well, so what during the course of your research did you discover that surprised you, or could could you give our audience like a quick a quick overview of what you did for your thesis? I broke it down really in the two uh, to three different categories for the thesis. Mm -hmm. The first I looked at was just asking. Did integrating partner nation officers into SP MAGTAS Southcom uh, strengthen our effects in the region? Did, did it strengthen uh, um, how many countries we worked with and what we were trying to do? Um, so very quantitative, very simple. I broke that down between 16 through, through 19. And I looked at how many personnel were integrated partner nation officers were integrated, how many um, military engagements we had per country. Uh, and I did that across the board. And, and that's where I just showed it or uh, correlated that in 16 and 17 and 15, there was 15 in there too, okay. that four countries, no integrated partner nation officers, no real change. We're strengthening partnerships in the region, but it wasn't really increasing. You got to pay for it. You're going to get this much strengthened partnerships out of it. But then when 18, we had one integrated partner nation officer, it, it about doubled to tripled uh, the amount of military engagements we did with the countries. And then in 19, uh, that's where the um, partner nation officers went from one to 10, and then about doubled again. And integrating those partner nation officers were, again, just about negligible cost to the task force. Nothing else changed, no change in donation of deployment. Uh, no, no change in U.S. personnel that are on deployment um, and no change in really any cost for the deployment. So it was uh, what I really look at in the paper is how did uh, integrating partner nation officers really strengthen a lot of the effects we're trying to have in strategic competition. And the big takeaway with that is this is something that does not need to be uh, restricted to the Southcom uh, uh, or SP MAGTAS South. It could be in any multinational or, or any non-multinational organization could turn multinational or any area we're trying to do strategic competition, which at this it's, point should just about be everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. So this this model that you observed um, unfolding over multiple engagements in this region. Uh, you you're making the assertion that this same kind of a uh, uh, engagement model can be copied and pasted worldwide. Um, in a sense, yes. So I, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean that's yeah. that's putting it you know very simplistically and everything. And I'm <laughs> I'm not trying to make the case like, hey, you know, all right, let's all. Let's all head to the O Club. Problem solved. But you know, uh, <laughs> a a successful model in one area uh, might also have uh, some similar benefits uh, elsewhere. Yes. So I I want to say so much a a model, but the mm -hmm. the concept of recognizing uh, the strengths of integrating partner nation officers, working by with and through them. I mean, we see it in all the the NSS, the NDS, uh, work by with and through partners, but very little is attributed to how to do that and, and what the benefits are. Um, but I, the only reason I was a little, a little cautious about saying sure. just for sure. copy and pasting the model is because I realized as I talk through this, um, I, I have a lot of inherent assumptions that I think just are automatic that I realize uh, I need to walk through a background a little bit because, because not everyone sees the same perspective and that's, that's partly just, 
my background is different. I had time in Southcom. I don't have any time in Centcom. I don't have any combat experience. So my, a lot of my career, the majority of it is working security cooperation, but mm -hmm. I recognize a lot of the uh, military members that have served so much time overseas and, and uh, CENTCOM and combat deployments have a different perspective on it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. just just laying a little bit, uh, the one thing I looked at the paper was the nature of competition, uh, the character of competition, the nature I would say is more uh, revisionist state versus status quo state. Uh, the current character of competition is um, uh, authoritarian versus democracy, which they're they're pretty synonymous, but there are a little different connotations with with each of them. But when I look at what what um, really is happening, uh, and I built the models in in my thesis, is to look at the strategic yeah the strategic competition, um, trying to combat malign influence or PRC and Russian influence, and what they do is they try to exploit the gray zone. So the best way to combat it from a democracy standpoint is to reduce that gray zone by increasing transparency. Mm -hmm. And we increase transparency by strengthening partnerships to build that trust and confidence and work with partners to the point that they can start seeing some of the things that we highlight with them, what this gray zone space is. So they understand a lot more is coming out of it. So that's where it's some people will ask, what what are we really getting out of it working mm -hmm. down there? Why Why are we... Uh, trying to just be good friends or strengthening partnerships. Like, well, we we have Russia and we have indo pacon We have real challenges. But uh, because these things are less tangible, um, there's still very significant uh, long-lasting effects, uh, especially, especially really, it's they're very low cost to hit too. When we're talking about a less than 300 person deployment that could have impacts and, and, Really, our 300 deployment, person deployment was a maneuver element in Southcom. Now, if you add Mexico and Canada, that's the whole Western Hemisphere that a 300 person deployment is having strategic effects on. So maybe they're small effects, maybe they're very hard to measure, mm -hmm. but you are having a very wide area of effects at a pretty small cost compared to the military as a whole. Right, right. And uh, uh, when you're discussing all of that, Max, I. I'm hearing echoes from you know one of our previous podcasts uh, relatively recently. Uh, we spoke with a guy named Dan Rundy, and uh, we'll have a link to his episode in the show notes. But uh, Dan was making some really similar points, I think. Well, one, uh, something that he claimed is that China is resourcing uh, their diplomacy efforts uh, uh, even more than they are resourcing their military efforts. I believe I have that right. But uh, China's China's global engagement uh, apparatus is uh, uh, enormous. And if we're not there, then you can probably rest assured that China is there in some way, shape, or form. So uh, having those kinds of engagement um, methodologies as you've been, as, as, as you have lived and as you're describing, Max, uh, seems to be, uh, something that we really do need to examine closely and lean into. Yeah, I, I know his podcast was great. Um, I actually already got his book and read it and it was awesome. Um, I, I mean, what, one thing he, he makes a really good case about in his book is he talks a lot about, um, international development and the development uh, 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 industry base in the, in the U.S. And in his book, he doesn't talk much about the military, but I see so much overlap. And, that, and that's the problem. We talk about one whole of government approach. Um, when we're trying to understand an environment or we're talking about uh, development and all the strategic competition, the military has a lot of great keys uh, or, or tools to assist with this. Um, we don't necessarily need to be, or probably shouldn't be, especially international development, be the lead on it. But then other organizations do too. And uh, especially reading his book, I, I realized there's so many areas of overlap where I wouldn't 
the military probably shouldn't be leading certain things, but there's still certain things that we could benefit, especially when we are talking about strategic competition. Mm -hmm. Um, That should always at least be uh, a secondary or third or fourth uh, effect of any activity we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when I look at the the money uh, economic piece he was talking about, some of the stuff I pulled from um, just the Southcom posture statements when looking at the uh, strategic environment in Southcom is um, from 20, 2002 to 2022, uh, PRC uh, trade with Latin America and the Caribbean grew from 18 billion to 450 billion. Um, mm. State-owned enterprises subsidized or underbid on infrastructure projects. Uh, there's seven or deep water ports in 17 countries, uh, 11 PRC linked space facilities. 29 out of 31 countries uh, in the Southcom region have PRC telecommunication infrastructure. So we talk about all that. They're they're there. Like when we when we start step in, they step in for us. And one of the strengths we have is these uh, uh, partner nations down there. They want to work with us. When we get down there, um, doing these humanitarian assist sorry, humanitarian assistance programs or just security cooperation, they are wanting to work with us. We have a task force that has it down. That's an immediate connection for relationships, which understanding that it's specifically through our military element of national power, it still reaches to their entire entire um, um, country. And, and one thing I really, key thing I pulled from his book, um, he talks about, I think it was 2015, when they tried to get uh, uh, the Americas together for international development and economics. General Kelly, the South Kong commander at the time, mm-hmm. pulled them all together. And Dan Rundy says in the book how impressed he was at how much clout or pull General Kelly had to all these countries. Um, so understanding we're looking at it from a military perspective only, but our military element national power um, has reached an influence to their entire country, given their military and their economics and their information, the diplomatic, don't necessarily mirror ours. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's where I think a whole government approach and a lot of things we do where it really, really needs to come together because we're not going to do it best. Um, the development industry base could do it best, but there's no reason they shouldn't do it alone. And especially understanding the environment, Department of State, everyone needs to understand the environment and our relations with them. So it should not be so siloed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good stuff. Um, uh, as just like a, a short aside, there's another gentleman that I want to invite onto the podcast. Um, I forget how I came across this guy's name, but um, he's an Australian, uh, r- retired Australian army officer, I believe, but he, he coined a phrase, I believe, uh, and he calls it, uh, conceptual envelopment. And, uh, it, it talks about, it, it kind of builds on, you know, Dan Rundy's, uh, stuff where, you know, China is, is integrating itself into the world, uh, system in ways that are, you know, just difficult to, wrap your head around but you know in all all kinds of ways um you know getting onto these various different international bodies and as you were describing you know with ports and and uh you know just all over the place they are um integrating themselves and um, something that we need to wrap our heads around uh very quickly and address um uh so you know uh, not to put you on the spot here, uh, Max, but it, will will your research uh, eventually be uh, uh, released to the public? I believe it will, right? Yes. So um, I finished the paper, and it, it's just going through the, the publication process. I, I am looking at other ways to to release it or put the information out there. Like, regardless if it gets published or not, I I think there's a lot of value in some of the findings that I would like to. Um, at least benefits community. Yeah, yeah. So follow. So when when it is released to the public, we'll be sure to circle back 
and uh, put a link to that access yeah. uh, in the show notes uh, as of when it gets when this episode comes out, which I'm estimating uh, the end of July of 2023. So if you're listening to this when it comes out, the, the the link to the study may not be there, but check back in a couple of months. Um, uh, but so who, who are the kinds of people that you would like uh, to know about this research? And who, who are the kinds of people that you would like to, you know, brief this to if uh, you could, you know, get get the right people into the room to, to talk about this? Uh, really, it's. Same thing. You can start from the brain core, go to joint, go to interagency. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think um, uh, the first thing that really drove a lot of this that I need to reach out to is uh, the research questions and focus of this uh, really initiated from uh, joint, I believe, J5's research request. They have on their, their joint electronics library a, a full database of uh, stuff that they want people to research and they're digging into. And it was what are uh, potential strategic uh, advantages that Southcom could use to combat malign influence in the region um, and also understand a cost-effective approach. So I think this through looking at the narrative and the culture piece, there are, um, there are some asymmetric pieces that we had just given the asymmetric nature of strategic mm -hmm. competition, mm -hmm. especially at a cost-effective approach. Uh, more and more recently, um, looked through the, the annual update for Force Design 2030, and when I look at this and I say the strength you can have with integrating international partners uh, exponentially increases the effects in terms of strategic competition. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily saying we need to bring back SP to Southcom. Um, JTF Bravo is down there. Maybe, maybe there's a concept or construct we could uh, – add on the JTF Bravo or, or, or strengthen that. One of the things I was looking at with ARG Muse, if ARGs, ARG Muse are going around and doing security cooperation, doing their port visits, doing the exercises, um, if we are pushing uh, the, the competition piece on it, could we put partner nation officers on it to one, work with them and understand how they understand the environment? Uh, with the whole recon, counter recon piece, it's all about sensing and making sense. Looking a little further out, if you have international partners on uh, an ARGMU and the Intopaycom from all the countries around there, all those partner nation officers are going to be culture experts on those regions. They're going to help you make sense of everything you're going around with while also carrying that competition piece, while also giving you those connections to their countries and facilitating all the, the informal communications with those countries too, which are key given how slow certain things can get caught up in the formal processes. But the thing I saw with uh, Force Design 2030 annual update is, um, I think looking at the, right here, I got the movement maneuver piece. Uh, it talks about 76, Task Force 76.3, uh, 61.2. But thankfully, like one thing I was pushing, it says right here, whenever feasible and in coordination with the efforts of the appropriate combatant commanders, these integrated staffs should also include key ally and partner representation to strengthen our integrated deterrence, offering a mature approach to campaigning. And then it also tasks down here no later than January 2024, PPNO uh, will propose uh, global force management modifications that prioritize forward deployed scalable mag tasks as part of flexible sea-based constructs that include integration with allies and partners. So very simply, I don't I would like to just reach out and talk to Force Design 2030 PPNO and say this is what I looked at. Use it as much as you mm -hmm. want, but use it. Maybe this can help inform how you, you do that integration with allies and partners, how much, who it is, what effects you expect to see out of it. So at, at a minimum, I think it could inform some of the things that we are trying to push. Well, um, excellent, excellent work. Excellent uh, topic. Uh, important, obviously. And uh, um, I hope that you are able to communicate this to um, a whole bunch of different stakeholders just to just to help help foment solutions which are useful 
uh, in engaging in these problems. Um, so I, I'd like to close out, if we may, Max, with like a, a quick lightning round. So 30, 45 seconds per response, that kind of a thing. And, uh, and, and, then, and then we'll close it on out. So uh, the first lightning round, women, peace, and security in competition. So very simply, I think this is really interesting when we talk about strategic competition, a lot of the soft power. Um, I, read, I read an article recently on uh, uh, the Gazette and just talked about women, peace, security, and competition. And very briefly thinking about and looking at it, if you have a lot of region in the world, regions in the world where you have half the population is underrepresented or um, yes, underrepresented in a sense, if the U.S. is a champion to help strengthen their their rights, which one is just it's right, it's proper, it's part of the the virtues uh, of the U.S. Twenty thirty years down the road, when that comes to fruition. I'm just thinking about the long-term effects of you have half of a population of so many uh, low middle income countries that now are sort of growing, getting a lot more strength. And they remember which countries really put them to where they are at versus others. And mm. however you want to steer a narrative, steer a narrative uh, that's going to be one that's going to be very difficult to break when mm. the U S helped champion them to be where they're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Second lightning round. Uh, so we, we had a podcast episode uh, a couple of months ago with the gentleman who created the uh, GDELT uh, data set, uh, Kalev Lataru. Um, so what are your thoughts on applications of GDELT uh, and AI ML for narratives? So that, um, mulling over that a little bit, uh, thinking about uh, sentiment attribution in a sense. And what I looked at was in, in his podcast, which was, which is great. A, a fire hose of information. Um, yeah, yes. He, he talked about the, uh, the, the Chinese spy balloon and they ran an ABC news broadcast six times in chat GPT. Um, and every single time it came out with something drastically worse uh, than what was happening. For example, satellite crashing or, or even uh, a nuclear attack or, or um, posturing for something like that. And so what I was looking at was when you get countries that are giving more of a uh, little um, overt uh, narration of what they're saying, a lot of them, when they say their they're overt sentiment, there's an underlying underlying sentiment. And when you look at understanding that chat GPT or GDEL can start saying, if you do these things or put this broadcast out, this is what the conglomeration of everything that ChatGPT put together will interpret it as. So when that starts getting a little better, it's rough right now, but the fidelity gets better, it starts to build some kind of tool that you could use for sentiment attribution, in a sense, for a lot of the less said. And, and then on the reverse, I think it'd also be really interesting to start using that as narrative wargaming, in a sense. So you have your narrative you want to push, but then throw it in this uh, system, chat GPT, GTEL, whatever it is. This is potentially one of the ways that it could respond. Oh, that's nothing I was hoping at all. Okay, go back and fix a little bit. I see. Yeah. Uh, last lightning round. Again, artificial intelligence and machine learning influence on the social science. Uh, yes. Oh, this one. So this one's going to relate to one of my one of my book recommendations. Uh, okay. which, which I yeah. know you're going to ask. Yeah. Uh, so artificial intelligence uh, basics by Tolley. Uh, mm. When I was looking at that, like I said, I'm coming from more of a, a generalist background. I didn't have a lot of these technical understandings until I dug into it, but um, it's, it's really not that far off to start getting some of this, that, some of these pieces. When I look at it though, and understanding how machine learning works uh, uh, and all these different pieces, um, we're starting to get a lot bigger pool of data uh, that we can use for a lot of the social sciences in a sense uh, where it was very slow and cumbersome and process based uh, before to go through surveys, to go through uh, um, uh, Hofstede has his IBM index uh, and so forth. But these things now are starting to 
give certain questions and, and information that you can pull very, very immediately. So I think having that kind of power to understand the social sciences in a different way is going to drive a lot of findings just in the entire field. Okay, excellent. All right. And uh, you, you, you preempted uh, the last question a little bit, but uh, do, do you have a, a, a book recommendation that you can uh, suggest to our audience? Uh, yes, I got, I got, I got three actually, okay. all, all, all with a purpose. Yes. Uh, so the first one was artificial intelligence basics, and that was by Tolly. Uh, but very simply, it's I think a hundred pages, but it hits from ground up all the different pieces of artificial intelligence. And from me, before going through the last year, um, didn't have much background at all for artificial intelligence. It was the Mystery, Skynet, anything artificial intelligence is everything artificial intelligence. But once you start reading into it and understanding automation, machine learning, uh, deep learning, it's very not uh, far to grasp. And I think it, where we're coming now today, at least those basics are necessary for everyone um, to understand how things are starting to work. The, the second one, um, just strategic competition. So I do know that there's the joint concept for competing that came out. You got the uh, uh, joint doctrine note uh, and the publication. Um, but what I found the most useful in understanding the character and nature of information competition was there's a RAND study, um, the role of information in US concepts for strategic competition. And that mm -hmm. I thought painted it the best and also particularly because it is uh, information focused. So um, yeah, little little cut and dry, not the most most uh, bedtime reading if you want it, but mm -hmm. I think that does a really great job of painting it. And, and, then, and then the last one is just, when we talk about strategic competition and classic that everyone should read, uh, The Village by Bing West. And that's just on the, the, the Marine Corps combined action platoons and it's, doesn't talk about strategic competition in today's sense, but the underlying message of security cooperation is, is there. I mean, it, it talks about working with them and being partners and understanding how that access and stuff builds. Yeah. All right. Excellent suggestions. And uh, with that, uh, Max Nada, you know, thanks for uh, your service and for this uh, contribution that you've made to this, uh, to, to our discourse in the form of your thesis. And um, I hope people check it out and engage with, with you on it. And with that, Max Nada, thank you so much for being a guest on The Cognitive Crucible. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.